You would be hard pressed to think of a more thrillingly dangerous job than test pilot in the late 1940s. Because at the time, it must have seemed like physics itself was being reinvented. Engineers were poking and prodding the very extremes of aviation to see where human ingenuity could push the limits of speed and altitude. And nothing is more synonymous with this time than the sound barrier. The idea of seemingly impossibly pushing a plane and its pilot faster than sound travels. Every component and every subsystem would have to perform flawlessly. The engine, the steel, even the human inside of it. All of it had to endure all of it. And in 1947, a boldly confident 24-year-old Chuck Yeager became the first person ever to break that barrier in an X-1 rocket plane. A man who clearly never had any moments of self-doubt punched right through a natural speed limit. This story shaped my childhood. The idea of getting into a plane and using engineering and a fearless attitude to go faster than a natural barrier spoke to me at my core. Chuck Yeager said it was all about pushing the envelope to see how far something will go just before catastrophic failure. And while I've had a lifelong fascination with speed and aviation, I didn't become an aerospace engineer, and I certainly don't test bleeding edge aircraft. But in my 30s, I decided to find the limits of a fleshy, carbon-based robot, the one I inhabit, and I signed up for the San Francisco Marathon and its accompanying training program with Coach Leo. I thought, marathons are nothing more than a test of your body's limits. How far can you push your subsystems before they fail? Nutrition, hydration, muscular skeletal, GI tract integrity, particularly that last one. If you've, uh, if you've ever run distance, you know. Can these systems stay nominal for four hours to push your body 26.2 miles, or will you suffer some catastrophic failure that grounds you prematurely? I approached this problem like any engineer working on any problem. I knew the obvious challenges. I'm not particularly athletic, and San Francisco as a backdrop is such a comically hilly city, sometimes when you drive there, your ears pop from altitude changes. But I know myself as a high performer, and I'd seen other people complete this challenge. I already knew everything I needed to succeed. I entwined my identity with completing this marathon. It was my profile picture. I updated anyone who would listen about my progress and all the fancy gear I had purchased. This was my sound barrier moment, and everyone was going to know about it. Because marathons are those types of accomplishments that are difficult, if not borderline impossible, but you can take credit for forever, like graduating or publishing your first novel. From LinkedIn to my gravestone, Marathoner was going to be a title I was going to own forever. The training program leading up to the race was led by a fit, relentlessly positive man named Leo. For three months, I would wake up at 6 a.m. on Saturdays and run increasing distances of 8 to eventually 24 miles. This program was really aggressive, and skipping or not finishing a training run would seriously set you back, or more likely, end your season. Things were on track for me until a particularly hot summer morning, when it was time to do a 16-mile run, the longest I had ever gone in my entire life. We were at Lake Merced, and at mile 13, everything in my body started to turn against me. My pace started to slow, then get slower, and then I stopped. And I watched the training group disappear without me around a grove of eucalyptus trees. And I can still feel that feeling of watching my dream of becoming a marathoner, both metaphorically and literally disappear around a corner without me. Because I knew if I couldn't finish this 16 mile run, I'd have no chance in completing next week's 18, and a 26 mile marathon would become a laughable goal. I vividly remember standing there on the concrete, baking in the sun, fighting that familiar quiver in my lower lip as I realized my entire identity as an unflappable high achiever who was capable of the impossible was invalid. 
and I picked up my phone, ready to call a lift and go home and give up. And I can't stress the incredible timing of this moment, but like Omar Sharif in Lawrence of Arabia, Coach Leo comes running back on the horizon to find me. He had done a head count and he realized he was missing someone. And when he got to me, he said, hey, what's going on? And through the vice-like grip my emotions had in my esophagus, I squeaked out the words, I'm sorry you had to come back and find me, but I'm giving up. And Leo, full of his signature relentless positivity, simply asked, well, what's bothering you? And I said, well, it's hot, my shirt is chafing me, and I think my nipples are bleeding. And he said, well, give me your shirt. So I did. Anything else? I said, well, yeah, I mean, this chest strap heart rate monitor that tells me my heart rate is really restricting my breathing. And he said, okay, give me that. Never wear it again. Anything else? He asked me. Yeah, I mean, every time I look at my phone, my pace is slower. And mentally, it's really hard to see it get worse and worse. And he said, give me your phone. And one last time he asked, is there anything else stopping you? And I looked down at my lack of excuses and my raw areolas. And I said, well, no, but, and he cut me off. And he said, listen, your body's scared. It's never done this before. It's gonna throw up every excuse for you to stop. But it's your job that when you see that check engine light come on in your brain, to take a little piece of electrical tape and stick it on there and keep going. And he said he would run the last three miles with me. We just had to concentrate on running six feet at a time. So I agreed. I pulled myself together and six feet at a time, we finished all 16 miles. And before I could say a word, Leo interjected and said, you know what, let's do two more. We can make it an even 18. And before I could really argue, we did. We ran another mile out and another mile back to bring the total to 18 miles for the day. And when we got back and I had put band-aids on my chest, Leo handed me my phone and lo and behold, those last five miles were the fastest of the day. And I was dumbfounded. I wanted to give up at 13 and instead his coaching and his belief in my ability to push beyond my system's limits not only got me through the run, they had gotten me to perform bonus miles and those last miles were the fastest of the day. And I didn't have the words, I still don't have the words to show my gratitude for this incredible gift of inspiration. So I just gave him a big hug and lifted his heels up off the ground. The kind of hug you really only reserve for your family. I couldn't believe it because I'd always considered the idea of inspiration to be flowery and for other people, something that goes on a poster in a teenager's bedroom it wasn't for me. I'm in my 30s. I'm a trigenarian. I was above all that hokey stuff. And I had approached running like a science, like a test pilot would. And yet, I couldn't deny inspiration was the one thing I still needed to achieve my goal. And from then on, I was no longer too cool to take advice. I listened to everything the coaches said about what to eat, what shoes to wear, even what clothes worked best, even if they weren't particularly Instagrammable. And I went on to finish the San Francisco Marathon, all 26.2 miles, a few weeks later, with a big, dumb smile on my face, knowing that I had solidified my sound barrier moment. The next year, the San Francisco Marathon asked me to be a coach, and I jumped on the opportunity. And after coaching for hundreds of miles, the story I want to share with you is I had a group of trainees on a 20-mile training run, and somewhere around mile 15, I did a head count and I had lost one. So I ran back in the course, and I found her on the sidewalk, doubled over with her hands on her knees. And I asked her, hey, what's going on? And she looked up at me and just dissolves into tears. And she said she was so sorry that I had to run back and find her, but she was giving up, this wasn't for her. And I channeled what Leo had explained, how the mental check engine light works. And I assured her that if she could do this, if she could complete today, she could do all 26. 
And the reason that I knew this was that I was in her same spot one year before. Everyone has this moment, but not everyone has a coach nearby. And she agreed to finish with me, and we ran the last five miles together, slowly, just concentrating on six feet at a time. And when we finished, she, she didn't say anything. She just wrapped her arms around me and gave me a big hug and lifted my heels up off the ground a little bit. The kind of hug you really only reserve for your family. We know these myths around the great figures in history, but it's rare to even get a glimpse of the self-doubt that almost got in their way. In this era of social media, it's more important than ever to remember that the struggle is what makes the seemingly impossible tasks unique and worth doing. I don't know what makes trailblazers do something for the first time in human history, and we need those larger-than-life Chuck Yeagers to give us a vision of who we want to aspire to be and catalyze us to get to the starting line. But more important are the Coach Leos in our lives, who believe in us and can inspire you to run six feet at a time even when it's hot out, you've hit the wall, and your nipples are bleeding. Achieving great feats is life-defining, but truly the best experience is when you can take all your struggles and lessons learned and channel them to be the leader for the next group, the next set of people who are taking on a monumental challenge for their first time. And my challenge to you is to recognize when someone else has hit their wall and is struggling and be their coach Leo, whatever the dynamic is, be it a teacher to a student, a manager to an employee, or a coach to a trainee, and perpetuate this cycle of inspiration. Thank you.